Hello everyone and welcome to our third episode of Vive Values. Very excited for our guest today. Just going to get her connected here and then we will have a great conversation about Will. If you have any questions for our guest today, please remember to pass them on through. Oh, here she comes. Hey, Hi. LaRue. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Good. Yeah, I can hear you great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Well, welcome. We are live, so let me just dive in here and just give everyone a little bit of background about you. So we have got the wonderful LaRue Peoples here with us today, and she's a partner in the Wills, Trust, and Estates Practice Group at Weirfolds in Toronto. Her view of estate planning is holistic and family-focused, and she believes in open, honest, and enriching conversations with her clients about their future. LaRue is a mother of two children. She's a wife and a daughter, and so planning for your family's future is very important to her. She understands the importance of planning for one's future and advocates for her clients and their families. LaRue was also one of our first trusted partners that came on board at Vive, and we've been so lucky to have her for three plus years with us. So welcome, LaRue. Thank you so much, Mallory. It's so nice to be here. Yeah. Yeah, so let's dive in. So we put together some questions that I know on my end, and I think probably on yours, are common questions that we get asked when people are coming to us a lot of times to do their first ever last will and testament. So we've got some good sort of baseline questions here that I'm hoping you can debunk some myths and get people going out there and getting their first will now that we're in this brand new year of 2024. Sounds great. Yeah, it's a great time to be thinking about getting it done. As you're exactly. Saying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, let's dive in, especially when you're like budgeting for the year too, because it's a cost for sure for some people that they need to think about. So let's dive in now and try to get some more people knocking on great lawyers doors like yours so that they can get this done. So let's start off. What are the most common misconceptions that you encounter when you talk about last wills and testament? For sure. I think the first uh, common misconception that we have is that a good will and estate plan can be prepared in a week or two. I liken it to cooking, right? If you rush your cooking, I mean, listen, we're all in a rush. It's, life is busy. When you rush it, it doesn't taste as good as that Sunday evening, maybe, where you've spent a few hours, you're letting things braise, you're letting them ruminate, you're thinking about it. Right. And so this is a really good analogy in terms of estate planning. People often call us and say, I really want to work with you. I'm really excited. Can we get this done in a week or two? And the answer, the answer to that is the person's been procrastinating often for years. Right. Mm -hmm. They have really made the call. They're finally committed to doing it. And what I usually say is we really need to spend some time thinking about who's going to be appropriate for each mm -hmm. role. And who's appropriate to be a beneficiary? Are we thinking charities? Are we thinking family? And so, you know, it's better to think properly, logically through who's the natural fit in the family. It might not be all the adult children for these roles. There may be certain children better suited than others. Let's have the conversation. Let's make sure that I provide all the different options or an estate planning lawyer provides the options, gives you some wisdom from uh, other people who've made mistakes ahead of you mm -hmm. so that you can learn from those and try and make a better plan. So. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, just today I had a couple potential client calls and they kept, one of them kept saying, everything's going to be simple. And yet she's explaining all these things that I promise are not simple at all. And I'm like, but it's interesting how I think when we're in our own lives, even you and I, right? Like we might do things like this for a living, but you don't necessarily see what's right in front of you. And the second that a third party looks in and goes, actually, that's not that simple. I think very few people have truly simple estate plans. <laughs> I think a lot of times they're complex and complex doesn't necessarily mean that something's wrong or something's bad or it's hard. It's just that we live in the 21st century. It's a complex life, especially I think in North America and our North American culture. And people need to realize that planning for your future death and what will happen to all of your assets and how your family will be treated is actually a huge task. It's like making a Thanksgiving dinner. This is not just some quick thing you throw in the oven as using your analogy, right? It's a big task to take on. Exactly. Yeah. And it's 
it's not that we want to disincentivize people to get going. <clears throat> it's no. just more about setting those expectations mm -hmm. of when you're contacting that estate planning attorney, um, that it is going to be a bit of a process. It is going to take a bit of time. We'll go as quick as we can uh, based on your schedule and, you know, what we can do. But, you know, you don't want to rush certain decisions necessarily, especially if you're getting some advice for the first time. Mm -hmm. You're letting that soak exactly. in. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Second question. So I get this one all the time. What's the point of having a will if you don't have that much extra cash floating around? For sure. And I mean, I think I've got two examples in this case. One is say you're an older person, you're single, you've never been married, you've got one brother you don't speak to. If you die without a will and your parents died before you, guess who's next in line according to the law of Ontario? Yeah. That brother you don't speak to. What if you love pets? What if you would prefer to give your money to the Humane Society? Yeah. Well, in that situation, that's a reason why you need to make a will, even if you don't have millions of dollars, at least mm -hmm. you get a second, right? Exactly. And then another example would be, you know, if you're a parent, so if, especially if the children are under 18, you really want to ensure that you're directing who you think would be best suited to take care of them mm -hmm. if something happens to you and also who should be managing their money. And mm -hmm. if you're common law and a parent, you especially need a will in Ontario mm -hmm. because common law parents are not treated the same as married parents under the law. And it can get quite messy and complicated if a common law parent dies without a will. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's something I people, I think when all the law around common law spouses in life, I'll say, was put into place, I think people just made a lot of assumptions that that the way that common law spouses were being treated would be carried over into death. But I believe it's only the province of British Columbia where they are acknowledged as such. Am I right about that? I think you are. Yeah, no, it's definitely we're behind the times, you know, a state's mm -hmm. law is an ancient creature. Uh, yes. you know, <laughs> We have so much language in there about, you know, people being married uh, as a child, having a valid child and things like that. Things that are mm -hmm. from time that doesn't necessarily apply, but we kind of still have to use because these documents, we tend not to change them very much because the court has recognized them in a certain way. So we want right. to make sure, you know, that's another thing. Clients see the draft and go, oh my goodness, what is all this? Old English. <laughs> and you yeah. go, well, it's just because, you know, we want to make sure the court recognizes certain, they want to be able to see certain things. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to get, we don't want to start getting too creative. It's not a creative writing class. No. Will, so it's not a, it's <laughs> No, it's definitely not. It's a very technical thing. I would say there's creativity sometimes in estate planning, yeah. but when it comes to actually writing that document, you do. You have, you know, you have so many pieces of law that you're following, but then also a lot of case law. So this is when people have litigated, explaining this for everyone watching, people have litigated and decisions have been made and those decisions become case law that lawyers like yourself need to rely upon when you're doing things. And so for a lot of people who have never been in the legal industry in any way, and we just are completely oblivious to things besides what we see bits and pieces of in the media, there's just so much more that goes into this. And even the most quote unquote simple life really, really needs a very you know thorough and well-drafted last will and testament. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> All right, so here's one. I know what age I'm going to say. Why don't we say the age at the exact same time and we'll see what we say. So when is the right age for a person in Ontario, I'll preface that, to get their first last will and testament? Ready? One, two, three. Eighteen. Eighteen. <laughs> All right, why don't you explain why we both said eighteen? For sure. I mean, I think, listen, we often think our kids don't really have anything at that age. We're funneling things to them or things like that. But there are instances where a young person has received an inheritance from mm -hmm. somebody else or there may be other assets in their name. And uh, we just want to make sure that things flow in the way that that child would want. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why it's important, even if you don't have a house you know, even if you don't have other things, it just allows you to direct where things go. Exactly. I also think it's about teaching that child, despite them being 18, I'm going to use the word child, yeah. you're teaching that child about a different level of responsibility that they haven't encountered. And I think there's also something about taking ownership, like they are an adult, they have control over their life, 
They can pretty much do whatever they want so long as they have money, which a lot of them don't. Um, but they can also choose things that happen to them in death. Like that's a very powerful thing and very hard for most 18 year olds to fathom for sure. Yeah. But also there, there's a lot of power in being able to go and hire a lawyer, probably with your parents' money, let's be honest, but hire a lawyer and have your own last will and testament drafted and know that it's, it says what you want, what you solely want. And that's a very, it's a very, I would think important thing. And I am, um, oh, who am I thinking of? I'm looking up to if I see his book, so I remember his name right now, um, Thomas Deans. Okay. Did I just get that right? Yeah. So he has a, he has a book, Willing Wisdom. There we go. I'm seeing it up on my shelf, Willing Wisdom. And, and he talked about, I think it was taking his son to the lawyer's office, like the day after his 18th birthday, being like, this is an important moment in your life. This is a rite of passage. And I love that. And I've actually told my daughter that that's what's happening on her 18th birthday. <laughs> she's, she's, not, she's turning eight in two weeks. So we got 10 years, but still like, I, I think that that's just an important moment in your life to say that I get to make these choices on my own. And it helps to teach them the importance of that document so that hopefully then they're going and periodically updating it as they hit major life milestones stones down the line for sure i mean that just that's the full suite of you know learning about financial management i think mm -hmm. that's a great that's a wonderful way of putting it so yeah. yeah yeah all right here's one that i get a lot so i don't have a will and i don't even know how to like get one drafted or whatever so i mean what are my first steps where they're giving you all the possible negativity that they can yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is like a little bit of homework and it, you know, it is unfortunate, but you know, you go into the dentist or the doctor's office and you're filling out paperwork. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing, right? The idea is each person, as we talked about, is not necessarily simple, but they have their own assets. They have their own family situation. And it really is better value if I've reviewed all of that in advance or an estate planning lawyer has reviewed that in order to advise you on what we think the best course of action is mm -hmm. for you. So you mm -hmm. are going to have to kind of pull some information uh, for us in order to do it. And it's unpleasant to do that and you're busy, but it will once that's pretty much the biggest piece of homework for clients. And then from there, it's usually, you know, reviewing things, coming up with decisions, all of that flows much better, but that's just mm -hmm. kind of the first upfront thing to just set the expectation that you're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, anytime, anytime, I'm sure it happens with you with clients too, they come to you. And again, they say they want something simple and fast. And people come to me and say, I don't need all these services that you provide. My life is simple and easy, and I don't need it all. And it's really just about a lot of times just educating them, because we as a society don't educate our youth and then people in the, even into their 20s and 30s on why this is such an important process right and why it should take time and why it should cost money you know i always say that when people work with me like yes if you're hiring a good lawyer a lawyer whose sole job is sitting there and writing wills and powers of attorney and things like that all day long then it's going to cost a good amount of money and that's okay because they are so well trained and they're going to give you an excellent document at the end of the day like this is what we're paying them for it's okay to spend money on something like this for sure. And, you know, it's also when we compare the costs of doing a proper plan versus having a family go through mediation or litigation, litigation and yeah. everybody hiring lawyers, it's really mm -hmm. a fraction of the investment. So we understand it's people's pre-tax dollars. It does hurt. It is mm -hmm. a personal expense. Yeah. Um, but it's an, it is an investment mm -hmm. in your family. Uh, essentially to make things as smooth as possible. The way that people care about and do things daily for their family to try not to put them out, make things mm -hmm. hard for them in the way mm -hmm. that parents do, everybody, you know, does around their loved ones. Exactly, exactly. Now, there are a series of platforms in Canada, online platforms that offer will drafting services. They also have power of attorney for property and power of attorney for personal care. Now, you obviously write the wills yourself. <laughs> you are not using an online platform when you do that. But what do you think about those? I mean, we've got a lot of millennials out there, young parents, where 
from a technical standpoint, these platforms could work for them and save them a considerable amount of money. So are you of the opinion that these platforms are better than nothing in a way? Like it's better that if someone's willing to spend a little bit of money, they have something that's going to help them if a horrible situation happens and they were to die? Or is it better that they take the time, not have a will and save up money and go to a lawyer? What are your thoughts on that? So I believe the market has a place for everything. I certainly do. The problem with online for the client is they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So the issue could be they, as we've talked about multiple times, think it's a simple situation. There aren't many issues, mm -hmm. but they don't really know what issues there are. And so they're just going to be putting something in place. But certainly, you know, especially parents of young children, do your research there are different types of platforms there's certainly a space it for it as an intro you know an introductory type of document mm -hmm. but the more you know you move through life the more assets you have or the more responsibilities you know the people i think of that i get nervous of are baby boomers who might be trying to access this who have more significant assets mm -hmm. and who perhaps have a more uh, a realistic family picture and that family picture is yeah. we know that the boomers have more assets than most of the generations underneath them mm -hmm. and what we're seeing mm -hmm. in the courts right now is the courts are acknowledging that some children are just not able to support themselves in the way that if their parent died they'd be able to continue to live the same quality of life mm -hmm. And so a boomer parent might go on there and be like, I'm just going to pump this out and say all to my adult children equally, sign it and call it a day. However, right. if you don't have the advisor, that's what working with an estate planning lawyer does. You have an advisor asking you the right questions, probing mm -hmm. and seeing, you know, are you supporting that child? You may not think you are, but if you go through the criteria, and we talk about it, maybe you are, and maybe we need to have a different crafted plan to try to prevent mm. any type of litigation in the future. So I do think right. there is a space for these things, but I do think that it's worth at least considering doing a consultation. Most of us offer consultations, and most of us would be able to tell you if we think things are a little bit more complicated right. um, than your average situation. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. I think anything, um, anything that is online, I think of them as tools and sometimes stepping stones. And I think that when when I personally work with younger clients where they do fit the criteria to use these online platforms, I, I say to them, okay, great, this is like us stepping into the water and hanging out for a while and acclimatizing our feet, right? But then like five years from now, we're probably not staying at the same spot. We're moving forward. Our children are older. Our life has progressed. We have more assets. Maybe a parent has died and we've inherited things. This is when we need to think about spending the money, working with a lawyer, like taking it up a notch. So I think that they're great tools in a way to usher people into this way of thinking, um, in particular for people who are so, you know, well, you and I working parents who just don't have time to think about anything else, right? And it's a great way to take a step into the estate planning world. But then um, I, I agree with you for, for, I always, people are always asking me about these, even when I'm in like potential client calls, they're like, couldn't I just use an online platform? And I'm like, we can't even go there until we are so much further into conversation together. There's no way for me to possibly know if this is an option for you. We need to really take the time to understand your full family dynamics and assets and liabilities before we can even broach that subject. Right. And it's great that, you know, they reach out to you, but many people, again, are not hitting the advisor role and are just kind of going yeah. straight, straight from the bank in, into that, into that system. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Exactly. But, exactly. But really, a buyer beware. That's, that's all we can say. And, and unfortunately, you don't know if there's a problem until you're gone. And so that yeah. is where it does get really <laughs> stupid and difficult, unfortunately. Exactly. 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 And the thing that I say, and, and I mean, I will say that we at Vive, we recommend one of these platforms. I won't say which one right now, but we do one that we've taken the time to vet and we really, really like and have had positive experiences with. But the thing that maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Larue, the thing that hasn't really happened yet is because all of these platforms are so new is that 
I'm sure some of the people who've had wills written on these platforms have died, but not necessarily enough of them have died yet where we see how what implications we're going to see in the litigation world and in the court system. Like, are these wills going to stand up at the end of the day? These are things we just don't know yet. And it's not me putting down the people who created these platforms. It's just we actually have to wait and see, wait and see if a lot of these wills become litigated in future or not. So it is smart for people to even if they find the online platform convenient yeah maybe paying for an hour of a lawyer's time just for a consultation just to make sure that the choices you're making are really good for your personal life and kind of hybrid doing a hybrid of the two if if cost is really a big issue for sure i think that makes a lot of sense and we can't dispute the importance of access to justice and i'm a big mm -hmm. believer in it in the sense that yeah. we do want we want people to get this done it is yeah. important so yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Last question. Another one I get asked all the time because people are always so worried about cost and time and ugh, right? So how often do you think people need to be updating their will? I think a properly crafted plan asks you to think about so many different variables that, you know, the preference is that you don't come back to do a small itty bitty change. Believe it or not, um, those of us who do this work, uh, those onesie twosie changes, we love to see our clients come back and it's wonderful to work with them again, but they're not actually, it's not for our business model, the most effective use of our time. Mm -hmm. It is nice to kind mm -hmm. of go back. So it's to me, I see it to my advantage to build out the, the product as far as I can to take the client into as many different situations as we can. Mm -hmm. I love when I get an email from a client and they say, should I update? And I say, no, because yes, something's changed, but the, the will accommodates it. So right. we're good. But that mm -hmm. being said, you know, we do say, take a look at them every five years, you know, just the mm -hmm. way you do other things, your taxes yearly or other things kind of on the fifth anniversary, just make sure, you know, have people died? Are there people you don't have a relationship with? Um, and those are the times typically to do updates or an inheritance, as you alluded to, if you inherit, uh, if your assets change, or of course, if you separate, right. uh, that's another time mm -hmm. to be thinking about it. Right. I know when I get asked a lot, a lot of times with boomer clients is they maybe have one or two grandkids, but they think they're probably going to end up getting some more grandkids down the line. And so they go in and they're like, oh, well, we're going to have to update our will if more grandkids come along. But there are ways that you can write things into the will to basically encompass future grandkids that get wrapped up into it. Right. Exactly, exactly. What mm -hmm. we can't plan for is if a grandchild has some type of disability right. that we want to account for, differently, but mm -hmm. otherwise, we can totally account for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely the most common one that people come to me with because they don't know if their kids are going to have more kids and they're just waiting to see and they're like, maybe we'll wait to do the will. And I'm like, no, no, that's not a reason not to. <laughs> Let's just get it done. So yeah, there's always ways, which is another reason why why working with a lawyer is great. There's so many, so many things that even I mean, I've been doing this a while that I just I I don't know. I don't think about and and same goes even if you went to a lawyer, other lawyers might know things and have different experience. So being able to educate yourself as much as you can and talk with people who do this for a living and spend a lot of time just with their heads down in this world is is so valuable just in terms of learning and growing as a person and preparing for your future. I also find clients are a really great satellite to educate other people once they've gone through mm -hmm. the experience, you know, yes. because you know that so many Canadians don't have a will in mm -hmm. place. It's always nice when someone does it. Yes. So, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I feel like I'm sure you noticed this, right? Like we went through our 20s and you get together with friends and there's the things you talk about and then those things just keep shifting. And I found that now and I don't know if it's because of what I do for a living, but now I just see people sort of in their mid to late 30s, early 40s who have kids. We've got mortgages that are insane. And we're just all sort of talking about estate planning more, yeah. I find, and also talking about our parents because our parents are in their 60s or 70s and we're sort to talk about estate planning and aging planning from that perspective as well so it's definitely a time in life when that becomes a good conversation which is why i think it's great when there is someone at that dinner party who's gone through an experience recently and can speak to that absolutely for sure mm -hmm. yeah yeah the best source of referrals i mean it's the personal connection that you make mm -hmm. with them taking them through that journey so exactly yeah.
Exactly. Well, this was wonderful, LaRue. And if people have questions, um, particularly legal questions, they might leave comments here. If they leave comments that are legal based, um, are we good to share your email with them so that they can reach out to you and, and set up a meeting if they'd like? Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. Wonderful. That, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much, LaRue, for coming. I really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Mallory, for having me. This is great. Awesome. And for everyone, Everybody watching, we'll be back in two weeks with another great guest to talk about retirement homes and retirement planning. So we'll see everybody in two weeks. Thanks, LaRue. See you later. Take care. Bye. Bye.